Amen. Why don't you just join me in prayer right now? Lord, I just pray for your spirit to lead us, for your spirit to direct us. I pray, Lord, that uh, we'll be ever mindful that you're always with us in the battle. Thank you, Lord, for the word. I pray that your word will be heard and proclaimed this morning. I pray your spirit will completely lead us. You'll direct us. We ask that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we've been in Nehemiah, but today I'm going to start off with a word, war. You know, we, uh, as a country, have been in lots of wars. You know, if you look at our country's history, uh, you could go to the Persian Gulf War, you could go to uh, Vietnam War, you could go to Korean War, you could just keep going back through time and we can even remember the one we just celebrated with the War of Independence. And we talked about uh, declaring our independence and celebrated that here in the last week. I want to ask you something. What if we had not fought in those battles? What if America had not really gone and fought? I mean, I guess if we didn't fight in the 1700s, we might even have a little bit of a British accent today. You know, or I might be hard for somebody like me, but, uh, you know, we might uh, think about uh, World War II. Think about if we had not stormed the beaches of Normandy. Think about if we had not been a country that fought during those times. Who knows? Nazi Germany or imperialist Japan at that time, we could be under their control. Here's the point. Wars have consequences. Did you hear that? And guess what? We're in one. We're in one every day, all the time. It started all the way back there in Genesis chapter 3. You could even say it started before Genesis 3. We just don't have it recorded there in Scripture at that point when there was a war in heaven. <laughs> you know? But there is spiritual warfare. Now, don't misunderstand. We're going to talk about warfare today, but I want you to understand, Jesus has won. We just sang about it. He won on the cross. Amen? He wins in Revelation. It tells us everything that happens in the end times, but for a season, we are in battles. And I'll tell you what, before we even dive into Nehemiah, go to Ephesians. I want you to just see that real quick. And go to Ephesians, and you go to Ephesians. The letter to the Ephesian church, it's in the New Testament. It's written there to the church. Make sure you hear that. To the church. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, here's what he says. He says, finally, be strong. How? In the Lord. And in the strength of his might. He said, oh, we're to fight. But how? with him leading us, with him being our strength. And if you read on in that text there in Ephesians, what does he say? Put on the full armor of God. That sounds like war, doesn't it? He says, you gear up, put the gear on. And if you read that whole text, he talks about your helmet, your breastplate, your sword. He talks about get ready for battle. But even in that text, if you were to go on, I, I think I only read or, uh, verse 11 there, put on the full armor of God, so what? So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And you go to the next verse, and what he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You might want to mark that right there in your Bible. He says, what are we fighting against? Rulers. Every translation is going to have a little different wording there. Against the rulers against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. What's he saying? There is a war between the forces of the devil and the forces of God. And the only way that you're in that kingdom of God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're not covered through the blood of Jesus, you're in the enemy's camp. You may not realize it, but you are. You are, and there is a battle going on, and I want to make sure you hear it as we start today that we 
R. Todd, you're going to have to help me. I'm hitting buttons and nothing clicks. It did on the first slide, but uh, maybe uh, we'll see what happens here. But uh, if you could advance me, that would be great uh, because I'm clicking away. And so Christians are in a spiritual battle. Maybe that was what was just happening just then. You know, I mean, uh, opposition and attacks will occur when we're doing kingdom work. We briefly referenced that last week, but you're going to see it with great clarity today in the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. But here's what I want you to hear. Go back and think about warfare. Think about some of those men that have fought throughout the centuries for our country. What if they had decided, hey, let's just retreat? No, Christians aren't called to retreat. What if they had decided, let's just dig deeper in the foxhole and try to run for cover? We're not going to fight. No, we're called to fight. Or what if we had just said, I want to try to do, and that's what happened in the late 1930s. There were some people saying, let's just try to ignore this war and try to just say maybe we'll never get drawn into it in any shape, form, or fashion. We'll just try to hide from it. That ain't going to happen. You can fool yourself if you want. But here's what the Bible reminds us. When he tells us to put on the full armor, he is telling us as Christians to go forward in the battle and don't let the opposition determine the direction. And here's what's happening today. I'll give my one-minute commentary. The opposition is determining the direction. It's happening all over America right now. The church is backpedaling. The church is saying, let's don't necessarily hold to the Word of God. I'll talk some more about that before we close today. The church is saying, let's try to accommodate everybody and everything. No, I'll just say it up front. Was Jesus popular with everybody when he walked on the face of this earth? Nope. Not a chance. Was Paul? We studied the book of Acts. People throwing rocks at him half the time, you know. We should expect it. But we're not supposed to let the enemy determine the direction. We're to be the voice for truth. We're to be the voice for righteousness. We're to be proclaiming the truth of Scripture. Go to Nehemiah chapter 4. We're going to talk about being overcomers in the face of the enemy and the battle. Now, y'all remember last week, we looked at a whole bunch of people with long names that we couldn't even pronounce in chapter 3, and we were uh, looking at all those names and said, these are people that uh, uh, were working together to build a wall. Look what happened. Join me, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Now, it came about that when Sanballat heard we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. Right out of the blocks, Sanballat, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, he's an enemy of the people of God. He is one under the control of the devil. And what's his reaction when he sees progress being made? Anger, mocking. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? You could almost hear him in the text laughing. Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Then Tobiah speaks up there in verse 3. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him, and he said, Even what they're building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. Y'all ever seen a fox? They walk gingerly. They're light. We just saw one in our backyard here in the last uh, week or so. You know if you read that verse, what's he saying? Something that's light as a feather, not even that much weight to it. Oh, their walls are crumbled down. Verse 4, Nehemiah cries out, Hear, O our God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you. For they have demoralized the builders. He is sitting there saying they've offended them. They've destroyed their will in some ways. Not really destroyed because look at verse 6. So we built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. They kept working. That's a takeaway today. 
Now, but notice what happened. They kept working. The wall's halfway up. Verse 7, now when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashtonites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. All of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem, the people of God, and to cause a disturbance in it. The devil doesn't like it when progress is being made. And he will attack and attack and attack. And you're going to see it, not just today. As we keep going through the book of Nehemiah, you're going to see every angle. The devil's trying to come in every way to bring an attack against God's people. If you're a believer in this room, you're in the battle. You're in the war. Here's the question. Sometimes the devil goes, oh, I'm not going to worry about those people over there. They're not doing anything. I'm going to attack the people that are active. The song that we just sang, in a way, should remind us. We should count it joy when we're in the middle of the fire because we're standing for him. I want you to take away today, and first thing I want us to hear is just to hear, spiritual attacks from the devil will come in many, many, many forms. I'm only going to touch on some of them. I hope you'll be back. We'll continue to address this subject as we go along and walk through the book of Nehemiah. Now, some of you know this. We've referenced it, but some haven't been here, so I'm just going to hit the highlights in about 30 seconds. The devil is a liar and a murderer. John 8, verse 44. If you're a note taker, you should read it, make note, the devil is a liar and a murderer. 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I mean, you can just take those two verses. You're like, okay, he is the enemy. We can go in lots of other places in Scripture, and he attacks in a variety of ways. What's the first way we see here? Ridicule and mocking. We've already seen it in the book of Nehemiah. It happens in America today. You see there, as we read there in chapter 4, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they really going to take all those dirty, dirty, dusty rocks? Some of them are burned. Are they really going to be able to reuse those rocks and really make a meaningful wall? And Tobiah goes, whatever they build, it's going to fall right back in. What's he really trying to do? Your work is meaningless. It doesn't matter. He's mocking them, ridiculing them. Do we have ridicule and mockery today? Yes. What does the world say today? You guys are old-fashioned. You still believe this, and you think you, that that Bible is relevant for today. The world is now more updated. People know more today. What are you thinking that the Word of God is really saying that marriage is between a man and a woman? You really are saying that there's two genders? Yes. Actually, I'm not saying it. God said it in the Bible. But people ridicule that today. People mock it today. That's where it starts. Guess what the church is doing all over, we'll just use our country, America. Retreating. What would you say? Yes. Exactly. Whatever word you want to do, we're saying we're worried about what the world thinks and we're not worried about what God thinks. And we're worried about somebody making fun of us, somebody thinking that we're a little bit too old-fashioned, somebody think we're a little bit too closed-minded, and that's the words being used today. You're closed-minded, you're intolerant, you're bigots. No, we're just saying we hold to the truth of the Word of God. But listen, I'll say a word to middle schoolers, high schoolers, and college students in this room. I could ask... Lance and Emily, I've, I've spent time on college campuses a lot in the last few years. They're bombarded throughout all of our education systems to say what? Well, you know, this isn't actually true. And it's chipped away at in a bazillion different ways. And we start thinking, I'll just back up. And in this text, he says, no, don't back up. Go forward and be a light be an ambassador for Christ. Nehemiah didn't back up an inch. But listen, ridicule and mocking wasn't the only way. They also created fear. In this text, I want you to look in verse 7. After they had taunted them, it says there in verse 6, they went right on back to work. 
In verse 7, it says, Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Astadites. Wait a minute. If you've been studying Nehemiah, you may have noticed a change there. When we first saw enemies, there was two people, Tobiah and Sanballat. Then the next time we saw enemies, it was Tobiah and Sanballat and Geshem. Now you get to verse 7 in chapter 4, you got Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem is one of the Arabs, Ammonites, Astadites. Let me tell you something. The devil will re- reinforce his uh, army, even though they're feeble, And he'll fight with more and more resources against the people of God. And that's exactly what they did. They were trying to scare people to death. It says there in verse 11, they conspired together to come and to fight against Jerusalem. I want you to read on down. I'm not going to read every verse right now. Look at verse 11. Our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them, kill them, and put a stop. To the work. Look at verse 12. When the Jews who lived near them came, I love that verse 12. I can just visualize. It said they told us ten times they're going to come up against us from every place. Can you imagine Nehemiah? Somebody's running in his uh, little tent there. It says, Nehemiah, they're coming to kill us. He goes, Listen, we got this under control. We're with God in a few minutes. Here's another one. They're coming to kill us ten times. People are scared to death. That's exactly what the devil wants us to be. Because if we're crippled with fear, we're not walking in faith. Did y'all hear me? If we're walking in fear, I can tell you, I've shared with y'all for personal testimony. When I was younger, I was scared, fearful, to go speak in front of people. I still remember it. I'm embarrassed by it. And the devil, I'm convinced when I look back on my life, some of that the devil used to prevent prevent me from being used in every way that I could have been at that stage in my life. The devil will use it. We are not to walk in fear. We are to walk in faith. No matter what we're facing, walk in fear. But the third thing that he does here is he creates discouragement. And if you look there, go back to verse 10. I skipped it because the people were saying things like in verse 10. He goes, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall." What's happening? It's a monumental task they're trying to do. They're trying to rebuild a massive wall, not only in height but in length. They got heavy stones. And if you read that text, they're saying things like, man, can we do this? Do y'all remember last week? There's goldsmiths. There's merchants. There's people from every kind of background. There's priests. Some of these people aren't really stonemasons or wall builders. They're getting discouraged. They're being mocked at. I want you to hear this today. You know what discouragement is? Lack of courage. That's exactly what the root of discouragement is. And that's where the devil wants to get us. They were getting bombarded, but I want you to hear the bottom line on this. The devil goes at us in a bazillion different ways. But really, what's it aimed at? He wants Christians to sit on the sideline and to quit. Bottom line, he wants Christians to quit being in the Word of God. He wants Christians to quit being active in their faith. He wants Christians not to proclaim Jesus. He wants Christians not to grow together in a body of Christ. He wants Christians to not make an impact on the world. Whatever he can do, He wants us to quit. Think if our military forces just said, we're not going to fight. We're going to go sit on the sidelines. The party's over when that happens. That's exactly what the devil wants in each life and in this church. And so we're going to spend just a minute. I showed you the bad side. I'm going to show you the good side now. How did they respond? It's a model for us how we should address Maybe I should say it's part of the model because as we keep going through Nehemiah, you'll see a few more tidbits. But how are we to address spiritual warfare in our lives? We all want to be successful on the battlefield. We all want to be a warrior for Christ. How does it happen? Go back and look at some of that I skipped. Notice right after the mocking in verse 4, what did Nehemiah say? Hear Oh, our God. Who's he crying out to? 
God. Go to verse 9. Right after they were intimidated, right after they were saying, we're conspiring against you, what does it say? We prayed to our God. The number one thing that shows up first. They don't show them fighting back with weapons. The first thing that we see recorded here is, Oh God, lead us. Oh God, direct us. Oh God, you are our strength. You're going to hear that more before we close today, but it is reminding us that we will not be successful unless we're on our knees crying out to God in prayer. Go read Ephesians chapter 6. I just read verses 10 and 11 where it says, Be strong in his might. Go down to verse 18 in that text when he talks about spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6. Guess what Paul says? Pray. I mean, right in the middle of warfare, he says, pray. Oh, by the way, in that same book, more than once, Paul says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for the church. He reminds us over and over again, we will not be in our individual lives or in the church who we are to be unless we're people of prayer. I will continue to challenge you in that area. I believe one of our great weaknesses in America today is we are not crying out to God in humility and confession of sin and crying out to God asking him to lead us. And Nehemiah gives us that model. I should have uh, counted it. We've probably got two or three times he's praying throughout this passage already. We're only in chapter 4. We must be people of prayer. But beyond that, read read, uh, verse 9. But we prayed to our God. And because of them, we didn't just pray. We set up a guard against them day and night. Now, that's an important verse. He says, hey, church, we don't just sit and pray and do nothing else. Hey, church, we don't just pray and say we do nothing. Nehemiah says we pray and we cry out to our God, but we also use our noggin. (laughs) He says, hey, we are to be vigilant. He is saying day and night. I knew we were under attack. If you don't know it today, the devil is ready to attack Buena Vista Baptist Church day and night. He is ready to attack each Christian life in this room day and night. Y'all heard me on that, right? Day and night. So Nehemiah says, put a guard up. Right now, let's go and start protecting ourselves. Read on down. Right after they were telling him in verse 12, they told us 10 times. Verse 13, then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people in families with their swords, spears, and bows. Bows. What's he saying? I know we're under attack. I know the enemy's there. If I were to ask things that Brother Kenny was taught when he was in the military. I guarantee we were taught to say, fight. Look at your weak areas. Make sure you fortify those weak areas. Make sure where you're vulnerable, you're protecting yourself. That's what Nehemiah did. I want you to stop right now. Where are you vulnerable? Where are you most vulnerable in your Christian life? We ought to stop and ask ourselves that. Some are vulnerable to lust. Some are vulnerable to materialism. Some of us are vulnerable to laziness. Some of us are vulnerable to, I guess you would call it apathy, where we really just don't seem to care. You know, there could be lots of reasons. But he says, stop and ask yourself in your Christian life, where are you? Here's another way to ask that question. Where am I spiritually? Am I the strongest right now in my spiritual life that I've ever been in my whole spiritual life? Your brain right now, when was I saved? When am I walking the most closely with the Lord Jesus? When am I making sure my life is protected and guarded and walking with Him? Is that right now? Because if it's not, today should be a day of repentance. Today should be a day to say, where is my spiritual life? But he reminds us, we should be aware there's an enemy. We should be aware there's an attack. You can go back and look at 
uh, movies on the military. You can think about history you've studied. But for sure, our forces would go through jungles watching, very, very aware. I think I told you that I've been to Vietnam, I think it's nine times now, uh, eight times there on mission work. I went down one time into the Mekong Delta. I'd heard so much about it and our forces, and I just wanted to see what it was like. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I cannot even imagine. I have even a greater respect for our forces. Boy, there had to be people hiding in all kinds of places there. They had to be ever, ever, ever vigilant. And that's exactly how we must be. We must get up each day when he says night and day to be vigilant. But I want you to see this. This battle's serious. Keep reading with me. I love this verse here in verse 14. When I saw their fear, this is Nehemiah, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight. And who does he say to fight for? For your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. Y'all hear me? Every one of us in this room, and I'll speak to leaders of households right now, moms and dads. He is reminding us in this text that we have spiritual attacks occurring against our friends and family members, and we must hold firm to the Lord Jesus. We must be in the Word of God. We must be serious about proclaiming Jesus, serious about growing together in Christ, serious about holding on to His Word. If not, we're going to lose people in our families. We're going to lose people that are our friends. Go look at all the statistics today. People go to church when they feel like it. Go look at statistics today. You think church attendance in America is going up or down? You know the answer. Why? Because a lot of it is we don't recognize the seriousness of the battle. A lot of times, we're not preaching the Word of God anymore. We give some message that's some feel-good message in some of our services and churches today, which I wonder, oh my, what kind of accountability is going to occur there one day? But every person in this room, hear me. Please hear me. We are in a very serious battle, and we should not walk out of here today flippant, thinking, oh, yeah, no big deal. If you think that way, speak to any soldier. They'll tell you that's the best way to get wounded or shot, killed, sidelined. We should be very, very, very serious with the battle that we're in, and we are in a battle. But I want you to see a couple of things in this story. Look at verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated the plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. From that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, the breastplates, and the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. What's he saying there? He said, we went to work every day. It'd be like, I took this half, y'all carry weapons. Y'all are bricklayers. You know what I mean? And he says, we're going to be ever vigilant. Work is not going to stop, but we're going to be careful that we're not going to get attacked from behind or in front of us or beside us or wherever. We're going to be on guard, and we're going to be very, very vigilant. And keep reading. Look at verse 18. As for the builders, each wore his sword, girded at his, girded at his side as he built. I love it. Here's what he's saying. He's saying there's people hauling rocks. There's people shoving rocks. There's people probably putting some kind of mortar in there. There's people trying to build a wall. But guess what's strapped right to their side? The sword. Guess what they have? They're ready for battle. Guess what they have there beside them? If I need to stop at any moment and fight, I'm ready, and I didn't leave my sword at home. 
Now, guess what the sword is when we talk about spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6? Anybody know what the sword is? There it is, brother. The, the sword in this Bible, Ephesians 6, verse 17, it says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to ask you, if you were a soldier, would you go out and your weapon is a sword? Would you throw it over in the corner and let it rust and kind of pick it up every now and then and maybe someday say, oh, I don't really need my sword today. I can pick up a stick. It's just as good as a sword. Yeah, would you think that way? I mean, that'd be stupid, right? Guess what? That's what we do every day. Y'all hearing me? That's what we do every day. We throw our sword over in the corner. We let it rust, gather dust. We don't think it's that critical that we get in the Word of God. All over Scripture, everywhere. There's not even a gray area. A bazillion times. I already used that number once today. But anyway, you know, it says what? The Word of God is critically important for our life. We must be in the Word. We must memorize the Word. We must be studying the Word. We must come together corporately to study the Word. The Word of God must be sharpened, well-oiled, able to come in and out of that sheep. I know how to handle it. I know how to use it in battle. In the Sunday school class I sat in on this morning, there was a reference made to Matthew chapter 4. You all remember Matthew 4? Jesus is tempted by the devil. What did Jesus, Jesus, what did he use in the battle? The Word of God. Three times. Oh, by the way, that's all he used was the Word of God. It's a testimony to us to use the sword. And right here, that sword is strapped right there to the side with a trumpeter right there beside them to sound the trumpet in case things got crazy and they had to come together and fight together because they were spread out on the wall. It says, our God will fight for us in verse 20. But as I wrap up today, I want you to hear something. Did they fight alone? Did they fight alone? No. Did these people, some of them guarding at night, some of them working at night, some of them with a spear, some of them with uh, something there to put rocks there in the wall. It requires working together. There's no way that we're going to walk in our Christian life and be successful. Our church will not be successful. That wall there is not going to be rebuilt unless people work together. If you're sitting in this room and think, oh, you know, I'm going to be a successful Christian. I'll kind of pick up my sword every now and then. I'll go to church every now and then. I'm not really going to go build relationships within the church, and we'll go study the Word together and come alongside one another and encourage one another. I guarantee you they need encouragement every day. I didn't finish reading it. If you look there in verse 21, it says, We carried on the work with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appears. Daylight to dark is the word we use today. In verse 22, it says, I said to the people, let each man with his servant spend the night. Some of them were staying right there guarding by night and working by day. If we read on, they said, we don't even have a time really to get a bath. They were working together. Two things I want you to hear as we wrap this story up. That's about as straightforward as it gets. If you read this, read it. Look at verse 6. So we built the wall. Look at right there in verse 15. Then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. Verse 21, we carried on the work. They did not stop. They had a passion in their life to say, more than anything in my life, I want to follow the Lord. More than anything in my life, I want to rebuild the wall in my life. More than anything in my life, I want to see my church walls strong and for us to be mighty for the Lord. And I will not quit. I love this story. I mean, they're saying, you can throw anything you want at us, but we're not quitting and we're going to keep coming. They said, we're not quitting. That's to be the church. Y'all remember Matthew 16? What did Jesus say? The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Now, he doesn't say every local church will stand. 
because some local churches will retreat. He says his worldwide church won't be defeated. But I want us to be one that never retreats. We need to be people that work together and say we will not quit. But I want you to see the last thing that was a secret to their success. Who'd they call out to in verse 4? God. Go down there in verse 14. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. He goes, remember the Lord who parted the Red Sea. Remember the Lord who dropped Goliath just like that. Remember the Lord who has called us and saved us and given us eternal life. Remember the Lord who has risen from the dead. Remember the Lord who is seated at the right hand of the Father and is coming again. Remember we're on the winning side. He's telling people in this text, remember, we serve Almighty God. We're not going to lose. It may be hard. It may be bloody. It may be tough on some days. But remember the Lord. And I want to ask you right now, where is the Lord in your life? Don't get me on that one. You see, the Lord had to be front and center. The Lord had to be, I've got to have the Lord leading my life every day. So how do you respond to that? Your notes today only have three things. They're very brief. And I want you to just stop and think in your life today. Or you're walking with Jesus as Lord. Every Christian in this room, I want to ask you right now. Is Jesus boss? That's really what lordship means. Is Jesus boss? Does he control my life, run my life, control everything about my life, and I'm all in? That's what this chapter is saying. We will not be successful. They didn't care what happened. They said, he's the boss. We're following him. We're under his authority, and we serve him. I challenge you today, where are you in that? Oh, by the way, if you're sitting here in the pew and you're saying, I don't know Jesus. You first have to recognize you're a sinner. Those two people that were baptized, just like I did, recognize I'm lost. And there's not one thing I'm going to do to ever save myself. There's not one thing I'm ever going to do in my life. And only Jesus, only his death on the cross, only Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, his payment for my sin, That's the only solution for my life. If you're lost, I encourage you to talk to me or someone here in the sanctuary today. But if you're a Christian, go read this chapter. Does God say, just kind of play around with Christianity. Don't get serious about it. Not once. Not once. We're in a war. And we need to follow our commander. And we must use our sword And we must use the Word of God clearly. We can't neglect it. We offer, and I, you know, you've heard me say it. I believe the Bible teaches it. We should be together. We're only together for about three hours a week. Not even really a full three when you count the time we're in Scripture of corporate study. Two hours on Sunday morning, an hour on Wednesday night. I encourage you to be a part of that. I encourage you to go daily, spend time in the Word. Day and night, Psalm 1, verse 10, the godly man meditates on the Word of God night and day. Number three, commit your life to Him. Commit your life. Simply put, what has Jesus called us to do? Proclaim Jesus. Grow together. Impact the world. Love him with all of our heart. He says when we get up each day, we should say, where is Jesus? The very first thing when we get up each day should be, Lord, I am yours. 
And if we are not, we are vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable to attacks of the devil. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the word. Thank you for the sword. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that uh, your spirit moves among us right now. I pray that your spirit speaks to each heart here. I pray, God, that we listen and don't ignore you. I pray, Lord, that we don't just be flippant and calloused. I pray, Lord, that we'll be people that bow before you today. Lord, I pray for your hand upon us at Buena Vista Baptist. I pray that we are used mightily in your hands. I pray for people to come to know Jesus as Savior. I pray for each of us to follow you fully and live for you, for us to be active on the battlefield. Oh, God, please, I pray that you will lead each of us by your Spirit. Lead us. We praise you, King of kings. In Jesus' name, amen. Is he boss of my life? Are there sins I need to confess? You respond to him in any way that you should respond. If you want to be part of a church and don't have a church home, you need to have a church home. We'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. Won't you stand with us and we'll sing.